Great. Thank, thank you so much, Celine. It's so, it's so nice to be here. Thank you, Baird. Thank you, Heis, for inviting me. And um, the research I'll be talking about today, actually, Selena helped uh, analyze a lot of this data. Um, so thanks to her work, uh, we have pretty figures and uh, some interesting and, and useful thoughts. So the the um, <clears throat> there we go. So the the basic sort of question that we have mm -hmm. here that that this research is about is thinking about the political effects of social media more broadly. But of course, we're going to test this out with something less broad. Um, just to sort of introduce this, uh, the issue here, uh, that's not working, is if you think about 10 years ago, right, we, we were quite optimistic about, or there's a good bit, bit of optimism about the role that social media could play in politics. On the one hand, there was this notion that it could be a space for deliberation, for the exchange of ideas, but also the idea that it could give um, people who are normally not part sitting at the table, not part of the political process, to give them a way to get around the sort of agenda of power. And so, you know, this picture right here actually comes from uh, the Arab Spring, when there was a lot of conversation about the, the role that social media could, could play in actually helping people organize. Today, I think that there's, we've, the pendulum has swung to the point of there being a great deal of pessimism about the role of social media in politics, that it's actually what we actually observe happen in the in the space of social media is it's a, a play actually for repeated arguments as well as misinformation, and that it does empower people to get around sort of the regular channels, but that also includes extremists who would like to to, to do terrible things. Um, of course, now of course this is a social scientist. This, this is a difficult question to answer, right? Because we automatically run into the selection uh, as problem. And a lot of the work done by, and I don't mean this to, to, to minimize the work done by folks who've thought about theoretically about the role of social media, but they often rely on sort of anecdotes and correlations. Um, but of course, social media is about selectivity and selection bias makes it difficult to infer causation. Um, thankfully, uh, we're not the, I'm not coming in here to tell you that I'm solving this problem. Others have thought about this and have approached this um, in, in, in interesting ways. And so uh, and I, I think you just told me that Chris, Chris Bale was actually here, right? So if you think about some of the work done uh, in this space uh, by Jenny Settle, uh, by Chris Bale, um, you know, they sort of tie together a nice suite of observational studies, as well as usually survey-based online experiments. And their work actually points to some some interesting, insightful conclusions that aren't exactly, that aren't always intuitive. And the one is that actually, you, you know, many cyber pessimists uh, are worried about filter bubbles, this idea that social media actually causes people to, to just talk to the same types of individuals in political spaces. This work suggests that that's actually not the case, um, that social media, actually Facebook and Twitter in particular, um, have algorithms that actually cause people to, to see things that they might not necessarily agree with. But this work suggests that that actually backfires. It, it polarizes people um, because they see stuff that they're not always interested in. And there's also a concern uh, about these algorithms that it also in, causes people to see political misinformation, things that, that aren't true. Now, this work is important. At the same time, like all research, it has its limitations. And one of the major limitations here is, um, well, observational research has its clear uh, limitations about um, identifying causality. Online uh, uh, survey experiments are excellent for, for demonstrating what could be the case, mm -hmm. but their limitation is they don't necessarily tell us what actually is the case because we're not actually observing how people are behaving in those social media contexts. Enter into the room some economists. <laughs> They always come in the room at some point and tell us how we should be doing our jobs. So this piece by Alcott et al. Um, has got, uh, it, 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 among people studying this this uh, this research has gotten a lot of um, a lot of attention because you know they say well why don't we use some sort of field experiment to study this problem? That's difficult to do because pretty much everybody is on social media, right? So you're not going to randomly assign exposure to social media in the world in which we live. So they decided to, to come at this the opposite way and do a uh, sort of a deprivation uh, experimental design 
where people are essentially incentivized, in other words, paid, to deactivate or get rid of their social media presence. They look at Facebook. We're going to look at Facebook here today. Facebook uh, has its limitations as well. Not everybody is on Facebook. Um, the sorts of people on Facebook tend to tend to skew older these days uh, than it used to be. But it is still the case that uh, it is the largest, by far, the largest social media platform in the entire world. Three billion people um, are actively on Facebook. Okay, and many more than that have uh, accounts that they don't check, like me. Um, okay, so I'll say a little bit about this experimental setup because it's gonna, it's essentially what we're going to replicate and extend. So what they did here was they uh, found a, they recruited a group of people who have Facebook accounts and use Facebook, and they paid people in the treatment group, uh, one hundred and two dollars U.S. dollars, to give up Facebook for a month around the midterm uh, election in 2018. This creates an interesting thing where the people in the treatment group are lacking something. They're lacking access to Facebook, whereas people in the control group have access to Facebook. So you have to kind of reverse how you think about treatment effects in this. It's the effect of the lack of Facebook rather than the effect of face having Facebook. OK, so what do they find? Um, one of their first major findings that has nothing really to do uh, directly with politics, is that um, giving up Facebook <laughs> for a month causes people uh, to feel a bit happier. Their subjective well-being, as uh, happiness researchers call it, is higher. So people reported being a little happier, a little more uh, satisfied with their life, less likely to be depressed, less likely to be anxious, these kinds of things. Um, so. That's the first thing. Maybe Facebook isn't great for our mental health, at least on the margins. They also found that giving up Facebook in the United States in the 2018 midterm election caused people to be less polarized in terms of partisan uh, polarization. But that it also, um, I'm sorry, that actually, yeah, that, da, 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 yeah, but it also caused people to be less informed about politics. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, a bit of a mixed bag, happier, less polarized, normatively good things, but also less informed about politics. OK. Now, this calls for replication, um, of course, because this is a particular time in a particular place. And um, uh, Nilia Azimovic and her collaborators at the SMAP lab at NYU do this. And they do this in the context of Bosnia-Herzegovina. Um, they run a very similar type of deactivation uh, face, uh, field experiment. They do so at a, for a week, rather than four weeks, and they do so in a context, in a particular context in Bosnia-Herzegovina, where um, uh, people, it's uh, in the middle of this week is a remembrance day, where people remember and commemorate uh, the, the, the Civil War, and, and it's supposed to be a time of basically trying to heal wounds from that period of time, Bosnia-Herzegovina. Now, this replication finds something very similar. People are uh, happier with their life. They know less about politics. But interestingly, they find that giving up Facebook for a week increases polarization. Here, polarization is defined as um, ethnic polarization, so how people feel towards their ethnic outgroups. This is not what they pre-registered. It's not what they expected. They speculate that one possibility is that what Facebook actually does in this context is that it allows people to see what individuals from the other ethnic group think at this time, and that they might have been more likely to be exposed to uh, posts where people say, yeah, you know, this is a horrible thing, but we all should come together. Whereas people in the treatment group who were not exposed to Facebook we're more likely to be in their offline segregated worlds where they were having conversations about all those bad things that happened to us. It's a speculation. Who knows? Who knows? So where's our intervention into this? Our point is that, OK, it's unclear what's going on with polarization. There's lots of reasons that it, Facebook might polarize in the US and depolarize. Uh, and other contexts. There are different dependent variables 
uh, for one thing. But one thing that's potentially clear is that Facebook makes people less happy and also informs them, okay? Rather than misinforms them, but actually informs them about politics. So this is something that we wanted to dig into. And one of the things that we note is that if you look closely at the, at, at the previous research, that giving up um, Facebook, people who give up Facebook, they need to find some other way to, spit, to fill that time. Mm. And how do they fill that time? They do so with entertainment, with other entertainment options, as opposed to seeking out political news. Also, to the extent that they're seeking out other information about politics, they have no other way of, to know what to do with it. So our question here is whether or not there could be an additional intervention, a nudge, if you will, to get people who give up Facebook for a period of time to, to engage in sort of healthy uh, digital practices. Um, you could think about this, you know, if, if you look at, there's a whole nother literature um, in uh, cognitive psychology that actually looks at this question, um, again, largely with sort of survey-based experiments that suggests that you can nudge people to uh, avoid misinformation, to uh, avoid being uh, polarized, to try to engage with political information in a more even-handed and balanced way. The analogy that I would use here is that the Facebook fasting or Facebook deactivation research is a bit like running an experiment in public health where you pay people to, uh, uh, to, um, to go on a diet, right? to eat less. You just say, consume fewer calories. And you observe that it has a particular set of effects. Right? Maybe they lose weight, but they also their you know, blood pressure goes up. Why? Well, you didn't tell them what, how to replace those calories or how to, how to eat differently in a more healthy way. So perhaps another approach would be to say, OK, eat less, but also eat in this way. Eat apples, eat salads, you know, eat, eat things that are healthy. Right? So that's essentially what we want to do in this study. So we want to um, replicate previous research. We think that's very important. I right? guess perhaps the other research isn't, uh, isn't repli re replicable, so we shouldn't presume that it's going to replicate, right? So we're going to do that. Our extension is going to say, OK, Let's create a situation in which we, uh, an experimental condition in which people have deactivated their Facebook account. Um, but we're now going to give them these interventions that the cognitive psychologists say work, that get them to be more healthy in, uh, in their space. And given time, I'm going to skip past some of this. Uh, just to give you an idea, how did we, what were these sort of healthy messages that we gave people? Um, in this uh, condition where people deactivate their Facebook account and also get these healthy nudges. We decided to do a throw everything at the wall approach. So essentially, there are four things that we do. These are things that previous research suggests should work. Um, we actually worked with a, a normative scholar on this, and uh, she helped also guide sort of how, how to do this. Um, people, I, I'm not going to go through these either, but uh, essentially, people in the sort of nudge group uh, received uh, these four messages across the entire experiment. They received them as emails. Okay, we actually did uh, the the participants we had uh, in this uh, study. They basically communicated with the the survey firm through email. So the survey firm thought that was the best way to communicate to them. And we did some checks to see that, yes, people are actually receiving and opening these emails. So uh, I'm not worried about um, sort of delivery of the stimulus. So very quickly here, um, how did the study work? So we did this in the context of the 2022 French presidential election uh, that happened in April of that year. Um, so at the April 1st, people got a baseline survey. The, the experiment started. France has an interesting electoral system that you may or may not be familiar with. It is a two round, uh, it was a majoritarian election system with two rounds. So in the first round, there were uh, 12 candidates. Um, so, we, uh, so the experiment starts here. So people are randomly assigned to giving up Facebook or not. 
The first round happens and then the messages come. Then we do a midline survey. Then we send the rest of the messages. Then the second round of the presidential election happens. This is where the top two vote getters from this round go face to face. Whoever gets a majority wins. Uh, spoiler alert, Emmanuel Macron is reelected as president in France. Um, on the 25th of April, we end the experiment. So we tell people they can go back to going to Facebook if they want to. And then we conduct an inline survey. Okay. The reason why we end the experiment before the inline survey is because we wanted to get a sense of what, what the take up, retake up rate would be. Mm. So that's one reason why we did that. And we thought in the midline survey, we could also get a sense of like treatment effects. Um, anyways, I could talk more about that in question and answer. Okay, how did we recruit people? We essentially did what previous research has done. We only, we basically can only make inferences about the group of people who, one, are active on Facebook, and two, are willing to give up Facebook for money. Okay? So if people were not willing to give up Facebook for money, they were excluded from our sample time. Okay? Uh, treatment balance looks pretty good. Uh, all right, so let me tell you about uh, results. Um, if anybody has any questions, I think I have enough time to take any questions. Any questions about anything that I've said at this point? Okay, seems clear. Okay, the first thing is that <laughs> people in the treatments gave up Facebook. They deactivated their Facebook page. This is the, the self report and uh, the mid, mid, uh, midline and inline surveys. So, Facebook reported safe Facebook use is less. We also paid the survey research firm. So if you deactivate Facebook, it is um, that you can verify that. And so every every morning, they randomly selected uh, people in the treatment groups to see whether or not they were using Facebook. They pinged them and said if they were and said, you told us that you would give up Facebook in return for a euro. So you need to do that. And what uh, the survey research firm told us was there was a, a very high compliance rate. They didn't have to send out too many emails. And when they did, people responded to them. When we asked them for the uh, spreadsheet with the evidence of that, they said, oh, well, we didn't, we didn't actually record that information. So we can choose to trust them if you like. Uh, <laughs> um, we, we also asked people what they did instead. And, uh, a little bit like uh, you know the other research shows, when people deactivate from Facebook, um, they they're more likely to to basically spend time report spending time with their friends um, or, or watching television. It doesn't look like our nudge treatments. The, we call this the deactivation plus information mm -hmm. condition. It doesn't seem like it really affected things. But one thing I want to show you, because everybody asked me about this, it's not the case that the people who deactivated from, from Facebook just all of a sudden went to Instagram or Twitter. There's not a whole lot of evidence of that. We pre-registered this regression model that we do. It's pretty straightforward. We have indicators for the treatment assignment. If we have uh, a baseline survey question of the dependent variable, we include that as well. And there's an error term. Okay, so what do we find? Um, we essentially replicate uh, the, 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 the subjective well-being scale is the exact same one that Asimovich et al. use. And I'm happy to say, so if you, I should tell you how to read these. The bottom uh, row here on these tables is the replication. Okay, that's deactivation only. These are people who gave up Facebook. They had no other uh, information. The top row of the figures is going to be the deactivation plus the information treatment. So those are the people who deactivate and get the nudges. Everything is relative to the control group. So all these treatment effects are relative to people who just kept using Facebook. Um, the uh, gray lines are the midline surveys and the, and the um, black uh, dots and lines are the inline surveys. So the deactivation, uh, so our study shows that people who deactivate Facebook feel happier. Okay, they feel happier. Um, the treatment effect is uh, around 0.1 standard deviations. 
which is a little bit smaller than previous research, um, but certainly kind of a minimal, um, what's Lakin's terminology, the smallest effect size of interest. Smallest effect size of interest. Uh, okay, now what about uh, the uh, deactivation plus information folks? We pre-registered pre that these people would be um, essentially even happier. We had a reason for that, but wasn't <laughs> she wedded to it. Um, that didn't happen. Um, and instead, two interesting things happened. So these red boxes mean that this is not really what we uh, expected. So it seems that, you know, being told to, you know, in, you know, avoid misinformation, try to, you know, be civil online, listen to different sides, all these kinds of things, maybe made people a little more anxious. Uh, and also maybe make people a little more bored. It's not clear. So, um, so anyway, so we basically, it's not clear what the nudges are doing here, um, but giving up Facebook makes you happier. So everybody should give up Facebook to have a point one standard deviation increase in subjective well being. Um, <clears throat> okay, now what about being informed? So we basically did something similar to previous work where we gave people a, a list of news headlines Half of them were true, half of them were fake uh, that we invented. Um, and we just said, are these true or false? The only thing that we did that was a little bit uh, different from previous research is we look at, previous research looks at knowledge about political news. We also looked at knowledge about non-political stuff, you know, like uh, what Elon Musk is doing, the Summer Olympics, these kinds of things. Um, in case you care, those are the false, those are the true things. Um, what what we find is that people do a little bit better than uh, a little bit better than chance at <laughs> guessing what's right. Um, take that as it is. Um, okay, so what do we find here? Again, people who just gave up Facebook, we find by the end of the survey, by the end of the study, they know less about they know less about everything politics and, and non-politics. But we also find something a little bit weird here for the, the nudge treatment. It looks like at the midline, maybe there was an increase in knowledge and by the end line, it looks like there was a loss, but obviously zero falls in those confidence intervals. Well, we also pre-registered breaking this out by non-political versus political uh, news. And what we find is a pretty much a null effect for non-political news, okay? Giving up Facebook appeared to not have any effect on that knowledge. The effect appears to be on political news, and that directly replicates previous research. And then, yes? The differences are not different from each other, right? From non Yeah. So from here to there? Yeah. It actually, uh, I did check this, and it actually is, but I think just barely. Oh. Like this dot, is just outside of that okay. common zone. Um, okay. <clears throat> We find a very weird and non-pre-registered, uh, it's been pre-registered this, uh, we, we pre-registered that, that when we got these informational treatments, it would cause, it would cause people to overcome the negative effects of Facebook on their news knowledge. It did in the midline. It did not in the inline. I don't know why. That's the honest answer. I can make up some stuff later if you'd like for me to. Okay. I don't know why that's the case, but that's what we find. All right. Now we sort of dig into this and sort of try to understand why. What you can sort of see is in both uh, in both conditions, giving up Facebook for a month caused people to be to be less involved in online discussions and to follow the news list, and that's irrespective of whether they're in the condition that nudged them, gave them these nudges or not. So giving up, how I interpret this is giving up Facebook, same problem. And the previous research, people don't fill the, that Facebook uh, news that they're getting by seeking out news. And our nudges didn't over didn't overcome that. Okay, so that's not what we expected to happen. What about effective polarization? Uh, well, Alcott et al. find that it reduces effective polarization. Asimovich et al. find that it increases social polarization. We measure all of them. We measure party polarization, ideology polarization, and in France, social polarization is around 
uh, immigrants uh, from Africa. And essentially, we find no effects at all. We did pre-register, um, and I'm not going to talk about this now because Bert would get mad at me, but we did pre-register. We did pre-register an interaction with education, and it does appear in line with our expectation that college-educated folks, I can show you this figure if you want to see it, but college-educated folks who deactivated Facebook were less polarized in terms of partisanship. Okay, we expected that. But college, but non-college educated folks were more polarized mm. if they deactivate Facebook. I think that explains why there's this sort of null effect here, and that we didn't expect that. So uh, it's a bit messy. Okay, so what have we done here? Well, we replicated. I think one of the interesting and important things about this 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 piece of research is, you know, mm. I'm now more convinced that Facebook. Mm makes people a little bit less happy, but it also informs them about politics. They learn something about politics from Facebook. Mm -hmm. It's this sort of news finds me effect that mm -hmm. comm scholars often talk about. Mm -hmm. um, okay, um, I'm still not sure what's going on with effective polarization. Uh, there could be many reasons for that. Uh, the, um, you know, probably the most diplomatic way to put this is that we find limited effects of these informational effects. It, it, maybe it can boost knowledge under certain circumstances, but it seems like outside of these sort of online laboratory settings where you give people a nudge and then measure their behavior right away, it, it doesn't seem it doesn't seem to trans to travel into the real world, at least in this particular field experiment. Um, I just told you about the education result, and so thanks. Oh, that's your oh, yeah. oh, mark. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, that's your mark. Yeah. I thought you wanted your <laughs> mark as your gift. Which we have for you. Uh, <laughs> the American version or the European version? I actually like the European version. Yeah. Even though I'm an American. Uh, yeah, it's a little bit. But thank you so much for yeah. the super interesting. Uh, so we'll open the floor for questions now. I'm just getting a pen and a paper. <laughs> Sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, thank you for, for the presentation. I was wondering about what to make of the implications of these findings that we are making people happier, uh, but we are making them less politically informed. Um, it seems like in your previous uh, studies you discussed, from the previous studies, it looks like people replaced politics with entertainment. Mm -hmm. Is that what makes them simply happier? And then uh, is this a trade that we should be making, making them unhappy so that they know more about politics? You know, I, I've I've given this I've given this some thought, and I still have not yet. And you guys can tell me whether I should. I, I've been a little bit resistant to it to to do a sort of um, mediation type analysis to see, you know. Whether or not you know uh, the sort of one possible thing is you know it increases happiness and that decreases news knowledge. Mm -hmm. I see from Bear's reaction. <laughs> I see he doesn't think I should. <laughs> we didn't pre-register doing that because I I, I I feel pretty bad. I I have a, not great feelings about mediation analyses, but we could do a moderated mediation. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, but that is one possibility that I, you know, call, I can't tell you really if that's the mechanism or not, but these results are at least consistent with the possibility that that is the mechanism. Um, that giving up, uh, that, you know, essentially not having access to news could make people happier. One thing I will say, we did ask a number of questions on the inline survey of people in the treatment group, just asking about their experience with the study. And, you know, one of the things that we found from from looking at that data is that people reported missing uh, the content that they that they saw. Right. That's vague. It's a big term. What do you mean by content? 
But it's very clear that they did not miss being on Facebook. They didn't miss, miss the experience of being on Facebook. And that makes me wonder if, you know, it's, it makes me wonder that if, if, if we looked at this a bit more deeply, that what's not, it's not so much that it's the politics that's making people less happy on Facebook. It's just all of the stuff about Facebook, you know, this, uh, you, you know, the feeling judged, the feeling like, you know, oh, this person is going on a vacation and I'm not, um, all those things, I have a hunch probably would pay a bigger role than like, you know, you see mm -hmm. some news that makes you less happy. Now, you, second thing, should we, let's pretend that is the case. Should we make that trade off? I'm not a normative scholar, but my guess, my opinion on this is no, we shouldn't make this trade off. Uh, being in a democracy requires a responsibility of citizens to have some level of knowledge about politics, some understanding of it. And that isn't always fun. That isn't always uh, a happy thing to do, but it's our responsibility as citizens. Maybe long term preventing very miserably. Well, I mean, you know, but the, but it, <laughs> well, that's true. That it is true. And also, like, the, the treatment yeah, increases subjective well being by 0.1 yeah. standard deviations. So it's not like people aren't going to kill themselves. Okay, Do so, I call them people? Or? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, uh, speaking of speculation. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and also about the Facebook experience and what might be driving this effect. Because I, I, I was wondering that. If people were, for example, seeing something that is purely entertainment and they're just having fun, for example, in common sections, sharing, sharing stuff, that's one thing. But then you see, for example, a post about something political, something that people might also have really strong attachments about. And then everyone just goes into this pit, into the common section, and they just start, you know, attacking each other. Um, and that might be one of the things that people kind of become a little bit addicted to as well. But it's always a negative experience uh, by and large. Mm -hmm. uh, what I was wondering is, is, could this be the issue? What is actually making people more unhappy about using Facebook? Um, but also how they get their information? Because let's say that I'm having an argument with someone in the comment section, which makes me go into Google and search for justification and search for articles. So then I right. can continue debating with them. I mean, it, it could be. What I will say is that, um, I mean, I don't, this is basically a punt because I don't have, you know, we didn't ask people about their behavior on Facebook, unfortunately. And it, yeah, the, so we don't have, we don't know how they behave on Facebook, right? So it's a big black box, like a lot of these space, like a lot of these field experiments. One thing that we, that we did do is that we looked at whether or not previous use of Facebook on the baseline moderated any of these results. And it doesn't. So, so people who use Facebook a lot, we saw this, we see the same treatment effects among people who use Facebook a lot versus not use it a lot. And if you're, if that thesis was correct, I would expect then that the largest effects would be among the users, the heavy users. And we don't see that. Now, there could still be another way in which that thesis could be correct, but uh, that's, that's what I have. Uh, two questions about the uh, effects of polarization in the results. So with, on the one hand, um, is it maybe something to do with the specific election? So there's a pretty, like two very just like candidates who re rerun I think of the previous presidential election. So I think it's particularly new people have made up their opinions. Maybe the, the, even the people who were on Facebook had already made up their minds. So it wasn't that much new. And I don't think it was particularly controversial. And the other point would be, is it something we want to do, or is it something we don't want to do to increase or decrease? Because like, you can imagine, like the Polish election that just happened, mm -hmm. the government could have shut down Facebook for a few weeks, and that would have demobilized the opposition supporters who wouldn't have received the, their calls from the vote, right? So, like I said, so what's your stance on that normative question? So on the first part, um, basically this sort of be a pretreatment effect kind of thing. Like we've already seen these people, so what's there to be polarized about? Totally possible. That that is a plausible explanation. France is also, uh, this election, you could also say, say that, you know, it, it <clears throat> the choice is a little different from uh, the U.S., where you have a two-party system that is essentially, you know, to the U.S. context, you know, a left party and a right party. Uh, in France, in, you know, this election, you basically had two candidates on the right side going against each other. So there's a lot of reasons for, you know, people on the left to, you know, who, you know, what exactly is polarization called for them, right? Um, so that's that's a well-taken point, actually. In terms of 
my opinion though about is effective polarization a good thing or a bad thing? I, you know, I've actually had a an evolution on this on this question. I think you know, in the beginning, like a lot of Americans, it was sort of like, oh, this is bad, this is terrible. We're all yelling at each other. But you know, once you realize there are other countries in the United States, and and uh, I mean, that was a I, I do mean those. Okay. Those are being recorded. I mean, those. Are um, so that effective polar, you know, I think that we have to, we need to start thinking about effective polarization as a particular social phenomenon that can have different uh, political and social implications, right? And like anything, you know, any sort of these sort of big uh, mass social kind of constructs. The implications can be both positive and negative, right? So yes, to the extent that uh, effective polarization is leading people to shoot each other and all these sorts of things, I think we can say that's bad. Um, but, but effective polarization can also arise in a natural democratic political con, you know, con, um, context where one side maybe is pushing the agenda too far and another side wants to stop that from happening. You could imagine instances in which that's exactly what you want to happen. Um, and I can think of no better place than that from a normative standpoint than instances of, of uh, democratic backsliding, right? So there is some suggestion that effective polarization can be a useful byproduct of illiberal moves in a democracy. In a, in a democracy. And in that case, I think it would be difficult to say, well, it's, it's, it's always bad. Um, but, you know, I'm not a normative theorist, so I'm going to leave it to the normative theorist to sort of like really work out when it when it's good and when it's bad. Uh, yeah, I think we're pretty close to that. I also have a question about the cost of change between the variables that you kind of lost in the image. Did you, maybe I'll show this in the slides, but I'm just going to ask, did you look at the, if um, between the variables, for instance, news, media, Informedness and uh, life satisfaction if there are any cross uh, correlations, or if one can predict the other one at the next time. Yeah, we didn't. We we have only we've only pre-registered and, and, and have at this point really only done direct effects and then uh, moderated direct effects. Um, but we we shied away from pre-registering any kind of mediation. I'm not opposed to doing it. I mean, it would be, I would think about it as sort of in an exploratory framework. And I have been seriously thinking about, or should, it's not just me, I co authored on this project. We have been seriously thinking about um, trying to see whether or not the sort of subjective uh, well being is kind of a mediator for the effects on, on uh, uh, I'm sorry, news knowledge is a mediator for the effect on self subjective well being. But beyond that, uh, And then Nikki, and then Thanks, very uh, interesting uh, presentation. I, I have a question which is, I think, more generally about the media diet approach. So, what you want to do is, of course, compare people who are on Facebook to people who are not. And my question is to what extent you are accomplishing that goal based on this research? Because the people um, who are not using Facebook now, of course, know that they will be back on Facebook. It's like, a vacation for them, right? I could imagine if you are not using it, that you would spend, you also said that I think, you would, you would spend your time differently for this couple of weeks, these four weeks. And um, uh, and, and you could say to yourself, well, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm just going to have fun with my friends rather than uh, also check the news. So could it be that what you find now is not so much, so the extent, so the conclusion that Facebook is good for political engagement it's not so much compared to people who are not using Facebook, but only compared to people who are, for this moment, are not using Facebook. That, that's an excellent point. And it's something that actually uh, we're a little bit careful about in the paper version of this, which is to say that, and it's something I should be a little clearer in the talk, the, essentially the, the, the causal effect that we're, that we're estimating is the effect of a, of a Facebook vacation. As you put it, so giving up Facebook for for a month for for a period of time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the you're right. The the 
the sort of the sort of counterfactual here that we're getting at, right, is somebody who is giving up. Uh, well, the counterfactual, since it's kind of a little backwards, counterfactual is somebody who's contemplating giving up Facebook for a month, but knows they can come back to it, right? Mm -hmm. And you're absolutely right. I mean, in that sense, it's a bit more like dieting, right? Like, you know, um, I, I could I could give this up. I can stop eating hamburgers for a month, but then I know I can eat them again. Um, so that's absolutely right that in order to make inferences to what would be what what would happen if we scaled this up and just obliterated Facebook from the planet, you'd have to assume that these these effects are sort of linear, that they just last in perpetuity. I'm not sure I'm willing to to make to make that assumption. And largely, this is a bit of the intuition behind the sort of nudge treatments, which is, well, you know, if we could get the people in the in the sort of information groups to to not behave in this sort of like, well, it's just a month, I'll just you know hang out with my buds and then go back to Facebook afterwards. If if you could actually get people to sort of change their habits in a way, um, you know, it doesn't seem like that. That happened, but that there's still the same, there's still the same critique of of that condition as well. So we would really need to do a field experiment where we like get people to give up Facebook for a year, right? Um, the thing is, we we had a, a very generous, very very generous uh, grant from the McCourt Foundation at uh, to do this research. We paid a thousand people, uh, eleven hundred people almost, eighty euros to give up Facebook for a month. Think about the amount of money it would cost to do it for a year. That's not that's not an excuse. I'm not, I'm not being defensive in that. It's just to say that that would be an excellent design. It, I think it would be, uh, you know, if there's a, if like Jeff Bezos or somebody wants to give us that money to test it out, we'd be happy to do it. But I also think you're a product of intervention. To some extent, there's an intervention which means you can change things but you could also see it as moving closer to the actual uh, situation where people are longer away, they're nudged to doing something differently, as you said. So your nudge might bring it closer to reality rather than, yeah, intervention yeah. suggests that it, that it is really different. Like maybe, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, Matthias, one of the things that, uh, that we do in the paper, and I try to be careful when I explain, but I wasn't as, as careful as I could have been here, is that we're definitely not testing what would the we're not answering what would the world look like if you got rid of Facebook? What we're doing is saying what would we do if you lived in a world with Facebook but people voluntarily gave it up, right? And if you voluntarily give something up, you always know you could take it back. Um, but that said, you know, we still don't know what would happen if people gave it up for two months or three months, you know. At least in some countries here, that is happening, right? There's more people going off Facebook. That's true. Yeah, there are people going on Facebook. That's true. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the interesting presentation. Um, if I understood correctly, you measured uh, effect of polarization on different aspects. And just thinking about the situation in the Netherlands, um, in the past decades, we haven't really seen any increase in ideological or effective polarization, no increase, no decrease. But we did see an increase in perceived polarization. Mm. Do you think this could maybe also be the case in Paris? For sure. Yeah, and, and that is, uh, uh, we did not include measures of like meta perceptions about polarization and those sorts of things. That would have been quite interesting to do. I wish I would have talked to you before we uh, fielded this study. Um, no, we but instead we included a bunch of stuff on We'll look at different kinds of vector polarization, and essentially, there's 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 no effects. Um, we could also get into a conversation about like what it means to measure effective polarization in multi-party systems. It's a it's a bit more complicated than it is in the U.S. context where it was developed. Um, but I certainly, you know, my hunch is that there is a perception in France that things are much more polarized and fractious than they once than they once were but i mean it's also interesting to yeah. see the effect of social media on people that i mean it would be it would be brilliant and there is some work suggesting that 
um, partisan news in general has an effect on increasing perceived uh, polarization. Um, so I'm quite sure that it, it would make sense that social media has the same effect. Thank you. Roberto and then Sam. Yeah, thank you for the great talk. Uh, I have two questions. One's a bit more innocent, the other one's a little bit more provocative. Okay. Um, so the innocent question is more is about a political interest and whether you measured it and how you're thinking about it. Because a lot of the knowledge literature on Facebook says that uh, Facebook is able to bring in the political apathetic by showing them and incidentally exposing them to stuff. So in theory, the, the increase that you see in political knowledge, sorry, the decrease you see in political knowledge when they're deprived is due to these people who are not politically interested while the political junkies just continue consuming and knowing about politics. Is this something you find? Is this something that you measured? Or? So unfortunately, we did not measure. Um, you know, you always have to make decisions about what to include on these things. And so, yeah, we were a bit constrained. Um, so we, uh, we did not measure political interest on the baseline survey. Um, what we do, 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 yeah, we do, we are able to look at things like cognitive reflection and stuff like that, but I don't really think that really gets, it doesn't really get at that sort of thing. Um, education, to the extent that education taps uh, interest, we did find some interactions with, with education. Um, it's not perfect. What I would say is I can't, I can't answer your question empirically, but our results are completely consistent with, you know, there are a group of people who had less engagement with the politics who gave up Facebook, okay? It would be consistent with the story that the people who generally aren't interested in politics, they didn't engage with politics without Facebook. With Facebook, they engage with politics in a passive way. It just appears in their news feed. News finds them, right? Um, but that inference is circumstantial. I'm happy with that. Yeah. <laughs> and then the provocative question, uh, that's about um, whether we think that political knowledge still matters today in the way, because I mean, we're taking measurements, you know, that people have been using 20, 30 years ago, this idea that political knowledge is the first step towards political engagement and political participation. So in a world where we have Google, where, you know, it, we can quickly look up answers to these types of questions and become informed very quickly. Is having these facts kind of like on hand as important and, and telling us what it thinks it think it's telling us as we did, yeah, 50 years ago? I mean, my my take on that mm -hmm. this is a provocative question, and so my take on this is that actually what's most important is uh, is the motivation to be uh, to follow politics and to understand what's going on. I think it's very important. Uh, so, Jared, uh, Jennifer Jarrett, and Jason Barabas sort of make this difference between sort of surveillance knowledge and sort of like basic political knowledge. I think it's important to have that people have knowledge about how their system works, about how politics works. Like, I think those are important things for people to have on hand because then they can make sense of the political information they receive. But is it important that people know every little detail about politics? I, I don't think so. I think there are many other ways in which people can make decisions about politics with heuristics and, and other things that help them get to, you know, the answers that they would get to if they were fully informed. But what I would say from a normative standpoint, if, if you want, the big leap there is that people are able to make, what sorts of decisions do people make if they're fully informed and are they consistent with their values and interests? And I think in order for that to happen, people do need to have um, some basic knowledge about how their politics works. Otherwise, you get you get you know you get people you know people find themselves in a situation where you know they want politicians to do things that either aren't possible, aren't feasible, or outside their control. And wouldn't it be better if people kind of understood those parameters? when forming their opinions about politics. 
That's what I would say. And I think Facebook has, wow. I mean, we asked surveillance questions, right? That's what we asked. Mm -hmm. I would be shocked if Facebook has any effect on uh, if, if you know how many seats are in Parliament or something like this. Mm -hmm. okay, we have time for a few more, so we'll just stand and then uh, yeah, okay. Thank you for the talk. It was really interesting. I was just curious about the limited effects that you found of the informational treatment. Um, and again, this is the recorded, so I don't know if I want to fully admit to skimming through my emails. But uh, <laughs> if you would have preferred to maybe give them that information in a different way than through email, or if you had a way to monitor if they actually engaged with that material and, and read through it properly. Or if you think it had more to do with it being like a long time frame, then maybe it. Yeah, yeah I, I, you know, you don't, it's not a, it's no shame in just skimming your emails. Uh, sometimes I erase emails that are very important. Um, <laughs> and I discover that later when people get mad at me. But uh, we actually, this is something when we first um, hired the survey firm to do this, we wanted them to send text, right? Not that, I mean, People can also ignore their text, but we thought that it's more likely. And they, they they assured us, listen, this is how we communicate with these people, okay? And so it's going to come from us, and they tend to open our emails because, you know, they might get money from us, right? Um, what I'll say is that on the uh, post-election survey, the, the, the inline survey, we did ask people in the nudge group to, you know, questions about the nudges that they received and checking emails. And it seems like, you know, the majority of them, uh, the vast majority of them actually did. They had knowledge of it. They remembered it. They, some of them said they even, it made them think, you know. Now, I think that's a, I think that's a special set of people, right? So if you were to ask me, like, let's say these nudging, nudges worked. Let's say they were just like, wow, you know, setting the world on fire. My proposal wouldn't be like, the government now should email everybody these nudges because mm -hmm. I'm with you. Most people don't check their email. So I would say we need to find a medium through which this is going to be most effective. It just happens to be in this particular case, email was okay. So I'm relatively convinced that the problem isn't uh, that they just erase the emails. So why were this, there are those small effects? I think that and here's my speculation about why we find uh, these sorts of, uh, if I can go back to them here, why we find this effect right here, where in the in the midline survey, people are a little bit more knowledgeable about politics, and then by the inline survey, it goes away. I think, if anything, there's a novelty effect, right? Like you get this email, it tells you to do something, you're in a study, like there's all these sorts of things going on, demand affects everything for people to say, oh, okay, right? But then, like everything else, like it's just you know, like you have other stuff to do. People forget about it. It becomes less, less of a novel thing. And we need to replicate this. But one uh, concern I have about uh, nudges to make people better digital citizens and all this sort of stuff is that these effects might simply be the very, 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 very short term effects. So. Very quick question, Pete, about the effect sizes. You, in passing, said, well, they're like 0.1 standard deviation, and therefore they're important. Um, but could you help me quantify that a little bit, and especially pitting sort of the knowledge effects compared to the mental health, because knowledge has pretty weak effects on most political outcomes. Yeah. So maybe should the conclusion not be that, you know, maybe the mental health effect outweigh, like, I'm not sold on this mediation thing. I think don't go there, but I think if you fit the two, no, because it could also go the other way around, right? Poor mental health, less knowledge, less attention to politics. Uh, but could it not be that, you know, could the argument not be that if this is a longer, tip, long, longer term effect, mm -hmm. that the mental health benefits outweigh the knowledge by far? Wow. Yeah. I mean, one thing I haven't done is quantify, and I'm not even sure how to quantify what are the sort of social societal effects of political knowledge or or social well-being for that matter. Well, I think you can a little bit with social well-being, but yeah, how much would that change how much, on average in a month? How much change in well-being could you expect? Right. So when I said that they 
that I think those effect size are at least minimally important is based on sort of Lakin's definition about whether or not people that can recognize that there's been a change, mm -hmm. right? Do they feel, mm -hmm. can they recognize they feel happier, that they feel more knowledgeable? It passes that check. Okay. I, I would not bet any money on it, pack it, on it passing the check that it's like, that these would, uh, well, you could bring Daniel Lincoln's in this again too. Whether or not these have societally important effects, they're gonna be really small, but you know, if you got 3 billion people to give up Facebook tomorrow, maybe that would aggregate up to something important, even though they're really, really small. Now for tomorrow? Ah, uh, geez, I can, I'm a room full of political scientists. What is the societal impact of political knowledge? If I increase political knowledge by one standard deviation, what effects does that have in politics? Well, I'm saying like, you know, do we know the answer to that question? How would we measure this kind of, uh, you know, checkable question? That's a different question. Well, 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 right. I mean, the, the closest piece of evidence I think I'm in this Scott Althaus has a book mm -hmm. where he sort of simulates and shows that people who have more knowledge about politics are more likely to vote correctly. And I can't, I can't, I, yeah, but I can't remember his his effect size, right? I can go back and check it out. But how much of that effect size is likely just well, people that know more about politics are also are better at aligning their vote choice with their thoughts. So, you know, I don't, I'm not sure we know the answer to that question. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you again for joining Talk Politics Lab today. Um, just a brief announcement for what's to come. Next week on the 17th, we have Marcus Wagner presenting a talk entitled Partisan Prejudice in Europe. Um, following that, the following week on the 24th, we have kind of a hybrid session. So some of the lab are going to be in Vienna for an iPad uh, conference. And so they'll be having Georgia Salani uh, speak in Vienna, but we're going to do a bit of a hybrid. So anyone here in Amsterdam can join us in room B102, and we'll also send an email about this as well. And um, so we'll zoom in for that talk. Uh, following that week, on the 1st of December, we have Lala Moradova. Um, she is from the Université of Pompeii Fabra. She'll be joining us. And the last talk of the year will be on December 8th. That's Stephanie Rager. Uh, no, 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 no. no. Okay, this is uh, <laughs> the second to last one. Um, <laughs> uh, she'll give a talk entitled Framing Disability Voter Evaluations of Candidate Self Presentation in Election Campaigns. And she's from the University of Strathclyde. And the last talk is, Final yes. talk is on the 15th of December, and we'll have uh, Pascal Boyer. And mm. we'll talk about our evolved psychologist and how we can do politics. And uh, before you all leave, I, uh, with the risk of sounding a little sentimental, but there are a lot of young people and new people that joined the lab in the room. And I think I, it's, uh, I want to say something, you know, Vin has been, I think, gave one of the first uh, talks in the whole politics lab. But I want to say something about the importance of academic relationships that are productive, because I know many of you. Uh, sometimes wonder about what it's like to be in science and science might sound sometimes like not the nicest place or not the kindest place but um, years ago I was sitting with Yif Lelkes in the office and Yif said and I said I want to go to the United States he said you should maybe talk to Finn and that um, we've got some money to go and spend a year with Finn in Philadelphia and I think um, was the start of a very uh, productive uh, and, and also very stimulating relationship and some of the things that were mentioned also today the dissertation event like a commitment to open science which is very common for everybody here in the room would have not started with uh, fruitful interactions for instance with Finn. Um, I am very happy Finn that you uh, are now closer by us than uh, that you've moved to Europe and uh, it's great to always have you as a colleague and also as a friend uh, and I just want to signal that like ac academia can be stressful and maybe also absorbing but it's it's always nice if you get to uh, meet people that are kind and nice and that you can call your friends so Finn, i'm super ha happy that you're here again thank you i feel the same way <laughs>